Welcome to Decoding Superhuman. This show is a deep dive into obsessions with health, performance, and how to elevate the human experience. I explore the latest tools, science, and technology with experts in various fields of human optimization. This is your host, Boomer Anderson. Enjoy the journey. My guest today is Unlimited Sciences co-founder, Del Jolly. Now, Del and I got connected through a gentleman by the name of Scott Carney. And Scott, thank you so much for this connection. We had a fantastic conversation today about psilocybin and his John Hopkins study through Unlimited Sciences. We got into a little bit of medicinal mushrooms, Dell's work both in cannabis and the decriminalization there, as well as the decriminalized Denver movement. You're going to enjoy this podcast because, well, we talk about a lot, and especially with the movement in psychedelics. The show notes for this one are decodingsuperhuman.com slash Dell, that's D-E-L, and enjoy my conversation with Dell Jolly. Dell, I know this is a long time coming, so welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate your uh, patience with the scheduling back and forth. So glad to be here. I I think, I think it's actually me on this one. There is a time where I had that word or or I thought I had that, that word that I can't mention without getting banned on every single news source these days. And uh, so, you know, uh, everything's good, but I have to thank Scott Carney for the introduction and uh, you know, I would love, or we're going to get into certainly a lot of what you're doing um, in the nonprofit and so many other things. But uh, if it's okay with you, I want to start because there are a lot of business people that listen to this show and you've spent quite a lot of time in the business development world. Uh, What brought you in to the cannabis space and I guess lately psychedelics as well? What brought you, what got you really interested in that space? I was uh, running my own uh, residential flipping business where we were working with, uh, some big outfits, some, uh, real estate investment trusts like colony capital, colony homes. And, and these folks who were just buying house after house, after house, after the crash. And I was flipping the houses and it's fine, but pretty unfulfilling. And, uh, I mean, as far as, you know, for, for the soul, I, yeah. uh, had seen a lot of cannabis movement. I was, very much against cannabis. I think in 2012, when it, when they voted to legalize, I don't, I don't know if I did or didn't vote to legalize it. I'd hope to think that my libertarian side came out and I said, yeah, go for it, you know, because I, mm-hmm. I like to think people should have. And we're it. talking in Colorado, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah in, in Colorado when they, they went to legalize in 2012, but I was, mm-hmm. I was very much against marijuana. And I'd always mm-hmm. say, you know, the whole, you know, script from there, you know, we eat for losers and whatnot while, yeah. you know, drinking no problem. Right. And so, uh, that certainly resonates with me. Well, I mean, that was my kind of story that I had as well growing up. It was more, you know, weed was the, uh, I don't know if you remember fast times at Ridgemont high, yeah, uh, like Spicoli. I, I just thought that people that, that did it would end up like Spicoli. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Sure. And, uh, I did too. And, uh, so, but through my, through my real estate stuff, I purchased a house that has a couple acres and I got back into gardening, really, really into gardening. And, uh, I had read Michael Pollan's book. If people are familiar with Michael Pollan now, it's very much from his new book, how to change your mind, but he has a lot of previous books that are definitely put him on the map, like the omnivores dilemma. That's what mm-hmm. I read. And I was just thinking, you know, food is medicine and, and we need to be growing our own food and having a kind of a soapbox there. And one of my friends saying, wow, you really talk a lot about food is medicine. Why don't you understand that about cannabis? And like, you know, oh, okay. And then I saw a, a documentary called the culture high. And I saw this father fighting for his son's right to use cannabis for his epileptic seizures. And it crushed me, man. It made me, I've got three kids and I thought, man, I'm, I'm a huge part of the problem where I've got a big mouth about what cannabis is without a true understanding of, you know, what's really happening here. 
and uh, dove into it a lot. I got connected with an organization called the Realm of Caring. This was founded by my, my co-founder now and uh, Unlimited Scientist, Heather Jackson. It was the organization that started, in my book, the cannabis movement here in Colorado. Their children, Heather's child, is the second person to take Charlotte's Web next mm-hmm. to Charlotte. Realm of Caring was started by Charlotte's mom and my co-founder and Unlimited Scientist, Heather Jackson. And they just started serving a lot of people, helping them understand how to use cannabis for serious ailments. And so uh, Realm of Caring has been around for quite some time now. They are an organization that's worked with Johns Hopkins for many years on how people are using cannabis and what for. And uh, so at the time, they were running a campaign around chronic traumatic encephalopathy, constant concussions. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of friends who fought in the UFC and the concussion game was kind of interesting to me. Uh, Just kind of started volunteering and sponsoring a golf tournament that they had. And I had this huge shift, this change of like, oh my God, I I need to, you know, atone for my sins for all the time. I've said cannabis is for losers. This is not, this is for people who need help. Um, It's for people who need to feel better. It's for professional athletes. And so I um, asked the realm of care. I'm in Longmont, Colorado, which is just north of Denver by about 45 minutes. Realm of Caring's in Colorado Springs. And and I uh, couldn't travel there. And so they said, well, hey, you should work for Charlotte's Web. And this is about five years ago or so. And so I started with Charlotte's Web and just it totally changed my life in the sense of just seeing how many people were being helped, how many people needed to be educated and uh, myself included. And Mm -hmm. uh, that was the beginning of my plant medicine journey. So that's how I got involved there. So you've, I mean, with, uh, with Charlotte's web, but also with colony and some of these, I mean, these jobs are not easy, right? They're kind of high pressure, uh, high stress jobs at times. Um, have you found uh, in your own life or even with some of your colleagues that uh, things like Charlotte's Web, the CBD, um, or other aspects of the cannabis plant, have you found it helpful with just kind of dealing with any sort of performance still with difficulties? Yeah, to be 100% honest, I don't, I don't really smoke cannabis. Okay. It just isn't. A I mean, neither that, do I, to be fair. Yeah, but but I know a tremendous amount of people who do for to help them, to help them keep anxiety at bay, help them with stress. The physical aspect for the majority of my friends who are uh, professional athletes, any high level athletes, they are smoking cannabis. That's, Mm -hmm. that's a fact. I do absolutely take CBD. Um, Whether or not I'm really feeling something, the things I do know about it, it's like, uh, just seems like something that, you know, when I eat broccoli, I don't feel broccoli. I don't feel yeah. great when I eat broccoli, but great I definitely quote, eat vegetables. What's that? Yeah. Great quote. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it's like introducing this plant that has evolved with us. We have an endocannabinoid system inside our body, which receives cannabinoids like THC. That's the one everybody knows, tetrahydrocannabinol. That, that's what gets you high, right? Or mm-hmm. CBD, cannabinol, or cannabidiol. I mean, there's there's over... A, well over a hundred uh, cannabinoids mm-hmm. and how they are so easily received in the body. It makes me think, okay, these are, these should be part of our diet. And so um, I definitely take it. I definitely do know that I sleep harder when I, when I use it. Um, I do a lot of jujitsu. So I definitely feel like I'm taking it to manage some of those aches and pains, but you know, it's not as prominent in my life. Uh, Mm -hmm. in the sense of, I don't see it immediately, but then again, I could drink a Red Bull and take a nap. So I'm not a, I'm not a good uh, candidate to kind of base whether or not it's working. But when you see a child having a seizure and you see them get introduced uh, cannabis and it stop immediately, there is absolutely something happening inside their body that seems to be overall good. So I consume it kind of for long-term health. That's what I'm always looking at. You know, how, how am I going to be functioning when I'm 80, 90, hundred years old? I think health is coming so far that the, the ailments we're going to have as humans will be more cognitive than anything. I think our minds will outlive our bodies 
And I am trying to do everything I can to make sure that my cognition is there when I'm older, because I think my body should be pretty good to a point, but you know, no matter what, even if you're 110, you're going to, you're going to have issues with that. Right. So Mm -hmm. if you're super fit, so, but your mind can be sharp as well. Of course, of course. Now, uh, because uh, look, I am potentially moving to Colorado and I, I love Colorado as a state and sort of the progression that it's made and the leadership it's really taken in many different avenues. Um, one of those leaderships you mentioned earlier was uh, sort of the legalization of cannabis, if you will. And I know you were involved in the discussion around uh, decriminalization of, of psilocybin. Uh, how does that really, how did that discussion come about in Colorado? Because, uh, you know, THC isn't legal in all 50 states yet. It's not descheduled. It's still a schedule one drug. And so how does a state like Colorado go from, okay, THC is on the docket to, okay, now we're going to decriminalize psilocybin, which there are a lot of skeptics, Michael Pollan included, that came out afterwards and said, okay, maybe this is a little too soon. But I want to just hear from like a firsthand account. How did that all get started? Yeah, well, fortunately, you know, our founding generations understood the uh, the importance of states' rights, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, we're a large country. California shouldn't be making decisions for Texas and Texas shouldn't be making Cal- uh, decisions for New York and, and, and these types of things. So states' rights is something that Colorado has leaned in. We were re- more recently a blue state. We used to always be a red state. Um, mm-hmm. But I do think there's that pioneerism that's part of the attitude, whether you're blue, red, whatever it is, uh, in that ability to, you know, strap the boots on by yourself. And that's kind of where I see health going, where people are starting to realize, okay, guess what? Doctors are humans. They can make mistakes. They're not these gods. They're not right all the time. And we're a pretty educated populace. And we think that cannabis is a, a good route to go. And, and now we also think that psilocybin is. And so as people start to learn and understand that cannabis is a healing plant um, and, it, and it should be used at people's leisure, statistically, alcohol is the most dangerous drug in the world. And we yeah, exactly the hell out of it. We not only mm-hmm. we promote it, we encourage it. And uh, that's not a good thing. But at the end of the day, we have said, OK, you are a sovereign enough person to make your own damn choices. We'll put in some laws and you need to follow those rules. And then you could participate in the most dangerous drug in the world. We've set that up. That's a that's a reality. We and and just cannabis. for for everybody listening here, I'm going to link to the study because I think it's fascinating. If you haven't seen it, uh, the Lancet produced a study that basically uh, demonstrated that alcohol has a larger effect on society, negative effect, of course, than psilocybin or even LSD and some of these other things that I'm sure we'll get into today. Uh, yeah. But sorry, I interrupted the. Uh... No, no, oh, no, no. That's great. It's good to have those studies to show that this isn't just me stating this. This is a. This is an absolute fact, studied fact. Alcohol makes heroin look like you know, white bread. So, mm-hmm. uh, we as a culture have somehow allowed that, and uh, we allow it to destroy families. We allow it to <laughs> do a lot of terrible things with the hopes and knowing like, Hey, I guess the good outweighs the bad, you know, to be able to have a cocktail after work or something like that. Like, okay. And so, um, Colorado has obviously been a pioneer in, in advancing these plant medicines. Um, after cannabis had happened, I had happened to have a psychedelic experience with my time at Charlotte's web. And it was something that basically, rocked my world and made me realize, oh my God, that's what I've been looking for for the last 36 years. When you're kind of like, you know, what's the, you know, always this deep search going on. And what I had experienced was a, a compound called 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, 5-MEO is what it's called. And uh, it, it was um, a, a powerful experience 
I knew that that was the future. And so I... Do you mind taking people through that experience a little bit? Because 5-MeO DMT is something we've got into a little bit on the show before. Um, but what was that experience like? If you can kind of, you know, to use the the phrase set and setting, if you can kind of lay it out for us. Sure. So, so one thing to just really clarify, like if you listen to Joe Rogan, he's always talking about DMT, dimethyltryptamine. I want to be crystal clear that 5-methoxy dimethyltryptamine is a completely different substance. 5-methoxy dimethyltryptamine is also referred to as the toad. It's a mm-hmm. secretion from the uh, uh, paratoid gland on a, on a toad where they milk it and they get the, uh, the poison and then you, you basically smoke it. And it's one inhalation and it lasts for about 15 minutes, which is very similar to dimethyltryptamine where you also smoke it. And it's about a 15 minute experience. The difference is, is one is incredibly expansive and uh, basically it's the comprehension that we all are one and there is no separation between all of us and we're limitless dimethyltryptamine I've always referred to is kind of recreational. It's very psychedelic, a lot of colors and interesting, weird things, not incredibly insightful. But so my experience with that is I had gone to a a ceremony and it was a ceremony where um, there's about 15 of us and we were, um, there was a shaman who was introducing this to us and we sat around for a couple of days and you know, one person would go and we would hold space for them. And then another person would go. And, and it was, uh, it was just something I'd never experienced. I never, never thought I would. It felt incredibly familiar, which is such a weird thing because it's the most strange experience I've ever had yet. It feels like going home. And, and so that experience, uh, just completely shifted everything about what I wanted to do with my life. And I'd had the the groundwork of cannabis of showing me, Hey, this is not what you were told. It was, there's so much potential here. And then a deep realization that that's the same thing that's going on with psychedelics. There's Mm -hmm. so much potential. There's uh, so many lies that are being told about it. And I think it's to keep people submissive to keep them not really knowing uh, this whole consumerism bullshit that we participate in boy, we're never going to find it. My, my, my uncle, if this, if there's a lot of business folks who are kind of um, listening to this podcast, my uncle clarified for me the, the perfect amount of money and the perfect amount of money, you know, when you strive and you're like, okay, when I do this, you know, then things are going to be okay. But the perfect amount of money, is just a little bit more, just a little bit more. Right. <laughs> and it's yeah. always going to be just a little bit more. And so until you get right with yourself about, you know, what's truly important. And that's what I've done through these psychedelics. It's allowed me to find a lot of peace and not chase things that are never, ever going to satisfy you, you know? And so um, after that experience, I knew that this was a, um, a real thing. I knew that I needed to spend my time advancing it so I can make sure that my children aren't going to jail for taking their own minds in their hands and not being told from some draconian moral basis that might not be in alignment with what I find is moral, that shouldn't be guiding our decisions on liberty. And as a, as a conservative, I'm shocked that this isn't a conservative movement, you know, seems to be a lot of uh, um, pushback from Republicans. And I would ultimately say that's probably where I align mostly. Mm -hmm. And because libertarians aren't really a thing, you know, in our, in our society. Yeah. As much as I wish they were, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It, I, I mean, it's a two party system. Wish. And so it doesn't always work that way. Yeah. Well, hopefully things will change because it's been pretty, pretty drab for the last. A, yeah, a while. I agree with you. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I had researched, you know, psilocybin. I started diving in on psilocybin because I'm like, I think that's going to probably be the next one. I'd seen studies from, Johns Hopkins. And I had uh, found out that Kevin Matthews, the campaign director for Decriminalized Denver, uh, was running a campaign. So 
I reached out to him in April of 2018, kind of found out where they were. It was a small group of really passionate people just trying to do their very best. And uh, pretty quickly, we started pulling in more people to help uh, just kind of lift this off to whatever degree we could. Uh, long story short, we worked pretty hard under the radar for um, a full year. There was a group that had been doing it before I got involved heavily. And then basically Kevin kind of spun off as the, the director. That's when I got involved. We worked on it for a year. There's about kind of like eight or nine core temp, uh, people who were trying to figure out like, you know, how the hell did we do this? You know, a huge group of volunteers who would catch, you know, signatures and get the word out who absolutely want it for us. And in uh, May 7th, 2019, the city of Denver decriminalized psilocybin within the city. So mm-hmm. that Can is- Can you explain for people what decriminalization means uh, in this case? Because I think, um, you know, if you go to, go to Portugal, right, where uh, a lot of these drugs are decriminalized, and I live not too far from there, uh, there's a difference in people's minds what decriminalized means versus what it actually is. Do you mind explaining that for a second? Yeah, I guess the best way to kind of think about what this future is going to look like, I see there's like four categories. You have decriminalization, you have legalization, you have medicalization, and then you have like religious use. And so decriminalization is basically city funds will not be used to prosecute people within the city of Denver for these crimes. Okay. It's still illegal. Uh, If you have a large amount, you're still going to jail. But if I'm jaywalking and I have a small amount of psilocybin and I'm walking across the street with it, I'm going to get in trouble for jaywalking. There's no funds that can be used to get me in trouble for my, for my psilocybin. So that from what I see, is probably one of the most equitable ways to go about this. That means everybody can have it. They're not going to be penalized. Now, whether or not that's the case with police officers, that's to be decided in courts. Um, But for now in the city of Denver, it's decriminalized. Multiple uh, uh, cities and states have followed since then. Oakland followed very much right after us. They decriminalized all entheogens. This includes, you know, ayahuasca, uh, Wachuma, San Pedro, uh, just plant medicines. Uh, we've got Ann Arbor now. Uh, DC too, right? DC did it as well. The whole state of Oregon decriminalized all drugs, which is the the best thing to come out of that election when there's a big, they so they decriminalized all drugs and they legalized psilocybin. So stepping into the legalization, what does that look like? That's a model. That's a that's a that's a business model. Okay. And so what Oregon has done is they are allowing for therapeutic use to where eventually you'll be able to sit down with your uh, therapist and utilize psilocybin in their office. How that all is going to unfold is not it's like basically a two year rollout, but yeah, because be the ru- the rules for that haven't really been rolled out at this moment, right? Yeah, they've got a committee who's kind of what's the best way to to roll this out. Now I'm, I am okay with legalization. And then, and well, let's talk about medicalization too. Medicalization is what other organizations are trying to do where they say, we're going to take this through an FDA process and and we're going to patent various things about that. And that's the way we're going to get it to the people that way. Maybe insurance will cover it, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. I, I am for access. Access is, um, really important. How we do that, that's that's where I start getting a little bit um, concerned. I personally, and, and let's just honor the religious and the indigenous use of these plant medicines that have been going on well before the United States was a thing. You know, I, I think that is very important to lay out, right? Like it's not just Peru, like this has been happening in Native American tribes um, for quite quite some time, right? Absolutely. So. Peyote is a sacrament, and actually the uh, um, sects of the Native American church have asked decriminalized nature to 
take peyote off of those lists for the decriminalization. They want it to remain a criminal uh, deal that because peyote is so susceptible to going extinct. It takes 20 years to grow, but it takes a very, very long time. They've championed this forever. We're just kind of steamrolling and walking in and saying, Hey, thanks for, thanks for dying for this. When we were yeah. persecuting you for this not too long ago. And now we're going to step in and we're going to patent these things and we're going to, you know, save everybody. And so let's definitely honor the native Americans who've done this for quite some time. And if they keep it uh, criminalized, then they could use it for their religious purposes, which is very, very important as well. So going back to Oregon and that model and what I believe is decriminalization is what I believe is the most equitable model that we we can see that's going to be received by the politicians and, and city councils and things of that nature. There's so many people have, you know, they it's utopia or nothing. And they don't understand like, look, we've got to, it's the give us an inch and we'll take a mile. And that's what the plan is. It's like when Heather Jackson in the realm of caring, were trying to change laws around cannabis. They didn't go in there and say legalize THC. You know, Utah's not having that, you know, some of these conservative states, they still haven't done anything to, to legalize CBD. So you go in and say, hey, CBD is non-psychoactive or non-psychotropic, and uh, it's helping our children with, with epilepsy, please allow this. And states would go, okay. And then after they learned, okay, that's not as scary, then they, you know, move it down the line. So anyway... And I know MAPS, for instance, is doing this as well as your nonprofit. We'll get into your nonprofit here in a little bit in terms of just having and opening those discussions uh, in some ways at a federal level, too. Um, it's very, very good. But. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, decriminalization just is something that's broadly sweeping. Legalization is something, okay, well, if it's legalized, then I'm a poor person. Let me promise you this, a psilocybin session in Oregon with a therapist, it's going to cost thousands of dollars. And, of the, and the reason is, is because it's an eight hour deal. It's actually probably an overnight deal. And so who's going to be paid to sit around for a full 24 hours before you're released for 50 bucks? No one. So that's out of reach for me now, right? Where, and also there's a, a long history of use safe use by the people for thousands of years so that legalization model i absolutely support it there's a lot of people who are going to need that and i welcome that after we decriminalize the medical model i am all for a uh, pharmaceutical application where someone who doesn't have the time to x y or z you know go to gym or find the community who's doing this or sit with a therapist, they might have to go to their doctor's office and their doctor ask their doctor, is psilocybin right for you? Right. And so mm -hmm. I'm okay with that as well, as long as everybody is, has access and they're not getting in trouble. No one's going to jail for the same things that are legal. It's just like, it's, it's a damn pity that uh, the amount of people have made millions upon millions and millions of dollars for the exact same thing that people are sitting in prison for, for life and not the exact same thing, way more than what they did, you know, yeah. selling a pound of weed back in 1980 and getting a life sentence for it, where in 2020, you're making millions of dollars for it. The, I always say the moment one tax dollar is collected on an illegal drug, everybody who's in prison for that, adios, you're out. Yeah, I, I think there's a huge uh, conversation that uh, people like Steve D'Angelo and others are pushing around um, uh, just making sure that the prison, people that are in prison be released, right? Because um, it, it is unfortunate that while we've progressed so much on the legal side, and yes, there's a long way to go, but uh, there's just still so many people that aren't getting recognized that the laws no longer uh, fit the crime, right? And so they should be released. And so I, I think I hear you. Like there's a lot to be done in in our prisons for sure. Yeah, yeah. So 
you know, as that, as that progressed, as we, as we passed May 7th, 2019, um, I just had seen the path with cannabis and seen that there's going to be some story that airs on CNN about a veteran or a mother or someone who's used psilocybin to help, you know, with PTSD, anxiety, end of life, you know, whatever the ailment will be aired one day. And already they're starting to do that. You know, a group of people are saying, man, I, I don't know anything about that. I want to learn. I need to understand. We need to understand how the community has been using it. So we launched Unlimited Sciences, which is a psychedelic research nonprofit. It's in the same spirit of the realm of caring, what we did with realm of caring. And uh, what we're doing is we've launched a study with Johns Hopkins University on the naturalistic use of psilocybin. So basically, what are what are what are the people doing in the quote unquote real world? How are they utilizing psilocybin? These studies you see, these are these are you know people are going into Johns Hopkins University. They're sitting on a couch with two therapists. It's a very um, curated uh, and highly effective way of doing it. But let's face it. We're not doing that. The people aren't doing that. The people are doing it out in the woods with their friends. They're doing it in ceremonial settings. Maybe they're doing it with their therapist underground, right? And so if people could uh, enroll in our study to help us understand what the good and the bad is, I feel that it's an opportunity for us to take that data, show best practices to some degree, Mm -hmm. and give it back to those who are going to... utilize these medicines on their own without a doctor it's going to happen it's just like putting your head in the sand because something's illegal is absolutely foolish right not to understand how heroin's affecting the the general population is a dangerous play right oh it's illegal i don't want to know that's crazy and so um psilocybin our study can not only help inform best practices to degree but also inform clinical studies We could show Johns Hopkins, hey, look, we're getting a lot of reports. We've had over 4,000 people enroll in our study. We're getting a lot of reports that people are using this. This is just an example. Maybe they're using it for Lyme's disease. Maybe they're using it for um, Tourette's syndrome, which I have heard. I've heard of people say, I have facial tics. The only thing that helps, cannabis doesn't help psilocybin has helped me with my facial tics. It's the only thing that ever has. I've never heard of that. And I'm sure there's tons of university people have not either. So tapping into the, the deep well of knowledge of people who've carried this for a very, very long time before other people saw an opportunity to, you know, take some pump and dump scheme public. Uh, if we could understand those practices and give it back to them, I think that's a good way to honor the uh, community who's kind of carried the torch for a while. Absolutely. And uh, Del, if it's okay with you, I'm going to come back to the study because what you guys are doing is incredibly important. And I want to come back to that and go into it a little bit more in detail. You mentioned the pump and dump uh, thing. And so I I have to go through this with you because right now we're kind of sitting in this, uh, I, I don't want to call it a bubble. But it's certainly a hot topic right now uh, where companies are going public with very little revenue or nothing in terms of revenue. They're raising tons and tons of money uh, around uh, either ideas that are very um, simple or they've essentially patented compounds that are exactly the same as, uh, well, psilocybin, for instance. Uh, what do you think, I guess, what do you think the wake up call is going to be? Because it seems to me right now that there is just a lot of money going towards the space and that there's a lot of people that are saying, Hey, money's coming here. And so I'm going to take advantage of it. What do you think that wake up call needs to be? Well, I mean, it's, it's your faith in the good old federal government, right? Like that's, that's why I'm hesitant. I, I don't doubt anyone's going to make money on this. I don't doubt that Compass Pathways is going to be, it's already proven to be an incredibly uh, uh, good stock. I don't know where I sit with them ethically right now. You know, I don't know 
if I could support a business that seemingly is in it for the money. And when they say no, but you have, you have articles coming out about George Goldsmith telling the University of Oregon, you know, that this legalization model is a bad idea. We shouldn't be doing that. That, that doesn't make sense to me where it's not. This is safe. I don't need a state to tell me that this is safe. Psilocybin is the, the, actually one of the safest uh, compounds in the world. Just mm-hmm. to give you an idea, the LD50 lethal dose at 50%. You'd have to eat like 32 pounds of mushrooms. Which mushrooms. Is, <laughs> I mean, uh, for those who have never tried mushrooms before, you're not even going to come close. You're talking like max a couple of grams. Uh, yeah. So. I mean, a, a humongous dose of psilocybin is seven grams. That's a massive, a hero's dose starts at five. So, so it's incredibly safe. So it's really interesting that they would, you know, act as if this needs to be provided by doctors and, and all this kind of stuff. And so, I don't doubt that they won't have some success and it's already shown right now that particular company, but I think there's a lot of other ones who are um, definitely betting on people being super interested in the potential of psychedelics and raising money and not really having a real well thought out plan. How, what, I mean, marijuana is federally illegal. There are a, million studies and a million cases to show that that's absolute bullshit. And if you have something like, you know, the, the disease that shall not be named and there's a vaccine that has been produced as rapidly as it has, and it's already got FDA approval yet there's 2,500 plus years of um, use cases of safety with cannabis and they can't put it together that's bullshit. There's, there's something a little bit more nefarious behind that in my uh, conspiracy mind, I guess, whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's kind of, it'd be, you'd be hard pressed to show me that they're not doing something wrong uh, when the efficacy is there. We know it's safe yet. they So, so to think that they're going to shift on psilocybin so quickly, which actually alters the way you think and actually shows that, you know, that system that they are advancing is a lot of bullshit. Why would they do anything to help advance that? And so to bet on that becoming legal, is not something I personally foresee happening. What I would state is it's the, it's the pick actions and shovels, right? It's what is being built around the psychedelic space that could be used outside of the psychedelic space. And then if it, does lift off or some states legalize, some cities legalize. So there's a little bit of a rollout. You're there, but you know, what's happening with ketamine? That's a schedule two. That's being used quite a bit. Um, there's some platforms like Maya Health, uh, which is my co-founder, David Champion. He is starting that. And that's that's a tool that could be used by any therapist or doctor to better understand what's happening with their patients. So whether or not psilocybin becomes legal that's a pretty incredible tool that they're building there to help um, better track outcomes. So those are the things I think are worth investing in, you know, the, the pickaxes and shovels, right? So not the actual substances. And the other thing too, is like, I don't, I don't foresee a legal dispensary type thing going on because uh, you know, what's it going to cost for an eight, 15 bucks. I participate in psilocybin. It's a huge part of my life. Maybe once, maybe twice a year, I'll use a big dose, a $15 dose, right? So I'm a $30 customer if I'm really getting after it. It's not. Uh, Yeah. $30 customer. But I'm also curious because uh, you are in this world and you do uh, speak to a lot of people and part of um, some of the integration processes. And I know Maya is associated with a friend, uh, Third Wave. Uh, is Paul Austin, they they include microdosing. And so uh, if we're kind of in this discussion around improving health, improving well-being, and just giving people a generally better life, um, psychedelics have been profound for me, and it sounds like for you as well. Do you think, think that there's a path to microdosing? 
becoming uh, not just accepted or even uh, not just talked about as it is now, but more accepted in then potentially available in a dispensary, so to speak. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, as far as it's, it, I, that could be unrolled very much like, you know, the cottage industry of CBD where people are, are producing that. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I believe in it. I think it's uh, important. And what I would say is like, microdosing is effective. And I know that, but I'll state it right here on this podcast. I believe functional mushrooms, you know, reishi, lion's mane, chaga, uh, cordyceps have just as much, if not more potential than psilocybin mushrooms. We just don't want to look at it because we see the shiny object and the cool kids doing the psychedelic deal where the potential in these mushrooms, I was at the Telluride Mushroom Fest this weekend. They are discovering brand new mushrooms almost every single day, right? There, there's a whole kingdom that is being ignored and has been ignored in the in Western culture for a very long time. It has so much potential, so much mm-hmm. potential. And I think things that are, there's no handcuffs around the legality. Uh, there's an incredible amount of data already out there in Japan. I, I thought I heard that like 80% of pharmaceuticals that they're developing there are coming from functional mushrooms or, or the, the, the fungi kingdom. That's tremendous. And, uh, we just look at shiny objects and want to chase it. And I believe in psilocybin. I absolutely do. I advocate, I've dedicated my life to it, but what I'm thinking and where I'm heading on a, on another venture is the concept that the fungi kingdom is neglected right now. And if we started putting some more money into that and trying to understand some of the complex compounds that are in so many different mushrooms, when I say reishi lines, you know, it's like five of so many, what is the potential there? Why aren't we looking there? Because there's no handcuffs around it. That's where I want to go. That's where we're, we're focusing a little bit of effort on a, a totally different venture that I'm haven't, we haven't really launched just yet, but um, I believe in the whole kingdom. If it's okay with you, we can go into some of those benefits. Cause I've had, um, you know, Eric Perot is is a very good friend, and I mentioned to you before mentioned him to you, and I'm going to connect you guys after this. Uh, he runs a very large farm in Finland, where they're producing some of these mushrooms: reishi, chaga, lion's mane. Uh, let's go into some of those benefits because I think this those are particularly interesting for those listening to the show. Um, I know I do. I use lion's mane almost daily. Um, uh, and reishi is pretty much a part of my night, nightly cocktail, but what are some of those benefits that you see from some of these mushrooms? Yeah, I guess I'll, I'll spill the beans to a degree because, um, you don't have to spill beans. We can always have you back. No, on. I mean, we'll talk about it later. We're, we're about to launch here pretty soon. We're actually just trying to do more R and D to make sure that the products that we kick out are efficacious. Um, but, uh, I'm launching a mushroom company called Umbo. Uh, Umbo is the descriptor of the top of a cap. I'm, I'm actually launching it with uh, Rashad Evans, and uh, who's a former UFC fighter, Hall of Famer, former champ, and uh, Jake Plummer, who's the former quarterback for Arizona and in the Denver Broncos. Uh, we are hoping to launch sometime in, in November. We have a functional mushroom bar. One of the ideas that we kind of see is like there's this mycophobia. People are afraid of mushrooms. We have a, a functional mushroom bar that it, it's phenomenal. It tastes incredibly good. And I think the idea of like, wow, okay, these actually aren't as scary as I thought they were could lead to people utilizing some of the other things that we're looking to launch like capsules and, and some gummies and these gummies are in capsules and things are, are um, uh, the ingredients are functional mushrooms like cordyceps. Cordyceps have been shown to uh, help with um, ATP production. So, you, you know, basically exercising, opening up your lungs, respiratory benefits there, cordyceps, the cordyceps sinensis uh, is found in the Himalayas from a ghost moth. This caterpillar um, gets infected by the fungi and sprouts a cordyceps out of its head. The Sherpas gather those mushrooms and the Sherpas would be eating cordyceps as they hiked, you know, 16, 18, you know, thousand foot uh, peaks 
And so they, it helps with the lung capacity there. Um, lion's mane, there's a lot of studies talking about how it comes out, uh, helps with neurogenesis. That's incredibly interested to, interesting to us, and especially like Rashad and Jake who dedicated their lives to quote unquote combat sports. Right. NFL is definitely a combat sport and getting hit a lot. They want to make sure their cognition's on point. So Lion's Mane has some studies coming out showing that it's beneficial there. Reishi is um, seemingly pretty effective to help with uh, sleep. They're all adaptogens though. And so an adaptogen is kind of a different category where basically the way that we foresee it is functional mushrooms are going to help you with whatever your ailments are. You know, they're going to bring you back into homeostasis for what you need. Maybe it's pain relief, maybe it's better sleep or whatnot, but to just kind of pigeonhole them, lion's mane is just for your brain. I don't know about that. There's some, you know, I'm. There's a lot. I mean, you can have some pretty cool dreams on lion's mane too. Yeah. So. Yeah, and, and microdosing is coupled with lion's mane, like the, the Stamets stack, Paul Stamets, yeah. who's a pioneer. The Stamets stack is 100 milligrams of psilocybin, dried powdered psilocybin, 400 milligrams of lion's mane, and 100 milligrams of niacin to kind of, you know, vasodilate, get your get your veins going and open it up. Uh, but the lion's mane is kind of like that. That's what I'm saying is Umbo isn't going to focus on psilocybin. We're, we're, the reason Umbo was started is to help up fund unlimited sciences so we could continue these studies uh i again am an advocate for psychedelics we're not going to waste our time looking at a microdosing deal when that comes around if it comes around and it's right for umbo at the time we'll step into it we'll let everybody else fight for that i did it with cannabis i've done my part on the psilocybin stuff i want to bring functional mushrooms to people i want them to see the opportunity there and believe in those it's kind of like a whole food group that we just kind of bypassed you know it's like if we made vegetables you know alien to everybody and then try to reintroduce again broccoli brussels sprouts people are like man these these don't taste fantastic you know there's things you do to make them taste great right and then you start falling in love with them but you're not going to take them and go oh my god i feel amazing right now right here and now but as you continue to eat them I think you will. I think you'll start feeling like your body will feel like, oh my gosh, this is something that I have been missing an entire species of fungi that we've been missing within our body. I think people will start feeling better, you know? Yeah. So that's kind of the hopes for Umbo. Well, I, I take between four and six different mushroom tinctures every single day. And so like, I'm a big believer in the functional mushroom movement. So I'm really glad you shared that here today and really excited to see what comes of Umbo for sure. Yeah. Uh, so Dell, I want to come back to unlimited sciences as we kind of wrap up and talk a little bit more on that study, because the study you're doing with Johns Hopkins is, is really important in the sense that, uh, Yes, I, I love what MAPS is doing. I love what Johns Hopkins is doing and all of these various uh, figureheads in the science aspect of this. But you guys are getting real world information from people who wouldn't necessarily be sitting in a lab. So can you take us through the study and how somebody can participate and what that experience would be like if they choose to participate? Yeah, so if everybody follows Unlimited Sciences on Instagram, that's where our, our, lar our largest audience is. And we talk about it sometimes as far as what's happening. But basically, what it is, is, is so you've heard of our study. You're aware that this is going to happen. You intend on using psilocybin. So you enter into our, into our study. What that looks like is it's basically five surveys. So the first survey is like asking you where you're at. You know, and it's a pretty, it's fairly in, intense, um, you know, your background, your diet, a lot of these things that just aren't being looked at uh, in, in other studies. And uh, so if, let's say you're going to take psilocybin in two weeks. You say, okay, in two weeks, I'm about to take psilocybin on this date. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we're talking about a large dose here. We're not talking that much. Correct. Microdosing. Yes. Yes. We're looking for the more experiential doses. So microdosing is not something that we're, we're focused on. So if you're going to do a larger dose, you know, typically over one gram uh, to have that experience, most kind of a median range that we've seen is around 3.8, I think is what it is now, but it's, it's very preliminary right now. But anyway, larger dose uh, psilocybin experience, 
where are you at? What's some of your um, background, past traumas? Some of the questions are fairly intense. It's a pretty long survey, uh, but we're, they're all validated measures. These are the things that we have to include to make sure that we get published on it. Uh, then you have, you have an IRB involved, right? Yes, this is through Johns Hopkins IRB. So an IRB is an institutional review board. What that means is that institutional review board is making sure that our study is uh, ethical and we're not guiding people or trying to get the answers we want or whatnot. So the IRB has approved this study through Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins IRB. Albert Garcia Romeo, who's an uh, absolute uh, pioneer again with that Johns Hopkins team, he's our principal investigator. Roland Griffiths and Matt Johnson are, are part of it as well. And so um, you get your initial survey when you when you say, I'm going to enter into the study. You, set, you, you have the date that you're going to utilize psilocybin. The day that that happens, you're going to get another survey right before your experience in the morning if, if you're going to do it in the morning. And that's kind of asking, where are you at today? You know, how, how are things? Are you still intending to use this? Okay. You utilize the psilocybin. You have your experience. And then within one to three days after your experience, another short survey comes up. How is your experience in this, in this type of stuff? And then um, let's see. Several weeks later, you get uh, um, another survey following up on how the experience has been. And, and it's just kind of, it, it's called prospective observational research, which means we're looking at where you're at before the surveys and after the surveys. So there's two before and there's three after, up to three months after your experience. If you complete all five, then it, it really helps our numbers. Again, they're, they're, they're not super fun just kind of a, it's, it's just the way it is, but I, I always feel it's kind of like, Hey, it's your way to give back if you will, you know? Yeah. I, I think it just with, uh, I've participated in several of these types of studies before and where it's going is it's helping people who either a are a little bit timid to use psychedelics and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Dell, but um, you know, timid to use psychedelics or are looking for best practices to, to learn really what's out there. And I, I really admire how you guys are conducting this study and you've certainly partnered with the right people for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've seen a lot of positive. There's definitely been some negative and we'll be publishing on both. We'd like to take this data and get some machine learning behind it to kind of tease out some interesting things, but we've already seen some really wonderful uh, data sets that um, just help a, a deeper understanding of what, what's really happening in, in, at least within the community that's participating in our study. But overall, just some tremendous health benefits and health outcomes. And uh, I think that that's, I always say there's kind of two avenues to create the change that's necessary to decriminalize these substances. And it's either, it's either people in the white coats who say, Hey, this is safe and we've studied it. And here's the, here's the analytics and data behind that and safety profiles through academic institutes or hospitals or things of that nature. And that's fine. And I appreciate that. But then there's also the heartfelt stories like the Charlotte, the a little girl having seizures, being introduced cannabis, what, human who has a heartbeat would deny that child that after she did every single thing she could, who would deny her that? That's a, that's a pretty heartfelt story. I foresee that happening in the psychedelic space where it's just going to affect too many people. And they're going to say, Hey, my son, daughter, you know, grandma, what has those same types of ailments. I want them to have that as an option. I always say, it's not my job to get convert people to use psychedelics. I don't care if you use psychedelics, just don't stop other people from utilizing it. If it's not within your deal, that's not your, it's not your right to stop someone else from choosing their own path. So well said, very well said. Uh, Del, this is incredible. I, I just want to wrap up with a few rapid fire questions, if it's okay with you. You know, you may be biased because of Umbo and everything, but what's your sort of top trick for enhancing focus when you need it? I, one thing for me that's big is every single day, especially if I'm kind of tanking a little bit, one conscious breath, just one, I'm going to stop everything 
drown out the noise. I'm going to take one breath. It's going to take me 15 seconds max. In and out and really be with that breath for one conscious breath. And then usually I could kind of refocus on what I need to do. So that's what I'd say. And that's something that's always with you. What excites you most about the health world right now? The fungi kingdom, functional mushrooms, psilocybin mushrooms, mushrooms as a whole, I think have a potential for health and wellness outside of our physical bodies, but for the environment, you know, micro remediation is incredibly interesting. Uh, the fungi kingdom is what excites me most about health and, and total wellness, total wellness being earth, you know, so fungi kingdom. The number one book, which has impacted your life. Boy, I, I, I could, I could read. You can go with a couple. I think I've had like one person say one book. So, (laughs) yeah, I mean, I, I would say the omnivores dilemma changing my perception around food, which then ultimately changed my mind around uh, cannabis as medicine, which has led me here. So that's a, that's an incredibly important book. Uh, I'm, I'm currently reading the uh, Tibetan book of the dead, which is a very, very interesting book as well uh, in the sense that just taking insight from other cultures around how they handle that, that is not taught in the United States in any fashion. Not only is it opening my mind to the rituals around dying, but also the concept that there's ancient knowledge that we actually have to go search for. And it's just as robust as anything that we've ever been taught. And so it leads me to think I need to learn more. So yeah, I'm the same way. I'm the same way. So Dell, where can people find out more about you, what you have going on with unlimited sciences and everything else that you're doing? I encourage people to sign up for our newsletter at unlimitedsciences.org. The reason is, is because uh, Instagram is just censoring the hell out of everybody right now. And <laughs> yep. we don't own our Instagram and it could be shut down any day. We already know a lot, a lot of uh, psychedelic advocates who haven't really said anything that would be legal, but so our newsletter is absolutely the best kind of uh, way to stay in touch. Uh, unlimited sciences, the Instagram is our biggest, um, page and, and audience there. Um, I'm again, starting to do a lot with Umbo mushrooms. You look at that on Instagram We're we're several months from launching just yet, but, um, I'm really excited about some of the content we'll be putting out there and how that will change mycophobia. Uh, those are probably the best two channels to kind of see what, um, we're, we're up to. Amazing. Del, thank you for taking the time. This is a, uh, look, I love what you're doing. And if I do happen to to move to Colorado, you can count on me showing up uh, at your doorstep in the near future. Yeah, you got it, man. I, this has been a real pleasure. And obviously, if you do come to Colorado, uh, you got to hit me up and we'll definitely sit down and talk some more because this is a, a good conversation and worth having for sure. Amazing. Thank you for everyone tuning in today and uh, hope Everyone has an absolutely epic day. As I've told you guys before, psychedelics have had a profound experience in my life. I've really uh, got a lot out of it. And so this is just one of many conversations we're going to have on the podcast about it. But if you have questions, you can head on over to really any sort of social media, plug in Decoding Superhuman and reach out to me. I would love to hear what you want to have covered on the future podcast episodes on this topic, but thank you today for your attention. The show notes for this one can be found at decodingsuperhuman.com slash Dell, that's D-E-L. If you enjoyed this podcast, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. Every one of those reviews just brings, oh, such a sweet smile to my face. If you're on YouTube, click subscribe. And if you want access to the show notes, advanced notice of guests, as well as the ability to ask questions to these guests, head on over to decodingsuperhuman.com and join the email list. Finally, this show does not provide any sort of medical advice. I'm not a doctor. I don't pretend to be a doctor. And if you want a physician or medical advice, it's probably best you go speak to a doctor. This is really just sharing information. 
And I hope you enjoy the sharing of that information. Thank you so much for your attention. Have an absolutely excellent.